Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. You're old enough to remember from the years 1974 to 1981, Alison Arngrim. She played the popular character Nellie Olson on the popular show Little House on the Prairie. Now, Nellie, she was a horrible child, wasn't she? If you've ever watched that show, she tortured Laura Ingalls in every single episode, it seems. Allison actually hasn't played that character since 1981. That's how old some of you are getting to be. She still acts, but that character, Nellie Olson from the 1980s is never too far into the background of her life. Allison was recently at a county fair in Los Angeles just a few years ago, signing autographs inside a tent with other former childhood stars. And it had been a long day of meeting people and greeting them and signing autographs. And just at this end of this day, a woman in her 40s made it to the front of Allison's line. And Allison looked up and she smiled and, you know, kind of put on that fake smile that you do. And she reached for something to sign, but this woman had nothing to sign. She just stood in front of the table and she turned different shades of red and purple. I mean, she was mad. She was shaking and she was closing her eyes and she was swallowing as if she was trying to compose herself. Well, Allison and her husband were starting to get a little bit creeped out by this. They became a little bit uncomfortable and were just about to call for security. And when the angry woman broke the silence with three words, words that she had to work real hard labor to get these words out, she said, I forgive you. And just like that, she turned and then exited the tent. Now, Allison had never met this woman. They had never exchanged a single word in their entire lives before meeting at the fair that day. Allison says that this kind of thing happens to her often, often. But this stranger at the L.A. County Fair had carried an angry grudge which had consumed her against a character on a TV show that has not even been on the air in over 30 years. The character Nellie had never bullied this woman, never lived in her neighborhood, because Nellie never existed in real life, people. It's just a show. But after 30 long years of carrying the burden of this hatred, she needed to lay it down and let go. Anger, bitterness, it has a powerful hold on people, doesn't it? Do you have someone in your family holding on to bitterness, holding on to a grudge? I bet many of us in this room do. I have a brother that's been angry with me for over 20 years. Here's why. Because on the night of his wedding, Angie and I, we put their leftover wedding cake in their freezer, not knowing that the freezer would stop working while they were on their honeymoon. 20 years later, he's proud of his hate for me and my family. That's not uncommon, is it? I wish it was, but it's not. Because we live in an angry world where people are bitter to the core. And I believe that Hebrews chapter 12, it confronts this mindset directly head on. And it reminds us of the riches that we have in Jesus Christ. It reminds us not to live like Esau, a man who went off and sold his birthright. See, Hebrews reminds us to hold on to our priesthood that Christ has given us, to look to the power that God has given us over sin in our lives, to look to the inheritance that will be yours as a child of God. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. And we begin with verse 14. Let's read it. It says, pursue peace with all people in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is a puzzling little verse, but I find it convicting that in the same sentence, we have the instruction to pursue peace with all people and at the same time to pursue holiness. Now, I want you to notice the wording. It does not say be at peace with everyone because you can't. You just can't. It's impossible. 
All you can do is your part to not hold a grudge, to not become bitter, to not become angry. Forgive. Be at peace with people when you can because God has made you at peace with him. Do you hear me on that? God is not commanding you to be connected and be friends with every single person that comes into your life. In fact, you may be surprised to know that scripture says some people you shouldn't be friends with, some people you shouldn't hang out with. Proverbs 14, 7, it says, go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him lips of knowledge. And Proverbs 13, it gives us the reason why. It says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be what? Destroyed. And Proverbs 22, 24 teaches us, it says, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go. You see, pursue peace, but don't walk with the wicked people of this world. Don't suffer the fool. Don't follow after the immoral man because he will take you down that road with him. Walk with the man or woman wise in the Lord. Be at peace when you can, especially with the people of faith. Pursue holiness. Hebrews tells us now holiness means to be set apart from sin unto God. Most of us know that holiness. That is our position in Christ. Now, I want you to hear me on this. That is our position in Christ. And God looks on his people, those with faith in him as holy people who have been set apart by God. Otherwise, according to verse 14, we would never be able to see the Lord. Now, the moment you came to faith in Christ, God made you holy in his eyes. That's how God sees you. That is your position in Christ. But that's not always how we live, is it? That's not always our practice. And that's why verse 14 says, pursue, strive. Some of your translations say for holiness. You have been set apart by God and you have been set apart for God. So now start acting like it. Now start behaving like it. Start living like it. Because the day is going to come when the Lord is going to make you sinless before him. And when the Lord returns, his people who have learned to walk with him, his people who have learned to walk and live a righteous life, they won't have to be ashamed when they stand before their Savior. A university football coach went out to practice on a Monday. And at this practice, his first and third string quarterbacks were out with injuries. And the big game was coming up on Saturday. And he had to make do with his second and his fourth and his fifth string quarterbacks. Well, sure enough, as these things go, five minutes into practice, his second string quarterback hurt his knee. That elevated the fourth string quarterback to the first string and put the fifth string on the second team. But then again, about 10 minutes later, the fourth string hurt his knee at this practice. That left the fifth string quarterback next in line for the first team. And there was a little bit of panic in his face. Well, the coach, he blew the whistle and gathered all his players all around. And he took the one remaining quarterback and he put his arm around him. And he said with a gruff voice, son, do you believe in magic? The quarterback, he didn't know how to reply to this. He didn't know how to respond. So in a half-hearted way, he said, well, sort of. And the coach just looked at him and pointed his five fingers at him like a magician would. And he said, poof, you're now a first string quarterback. And it was true. No magic to it at all, right? That was his position now. But in practice, he had what? A long way to go. And the coach only had a week to get him into shape. And this is the way it is for anyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior. You have a first string position on God's team, but in practice, you have a long way to go. And the only difference is that you have more than a week. Hopefully, hopefully, maybe you don't. I don't know. But you have a whole lifetime to get into shape. You're set apart for God's special use, and every believer is a priest to the living God. So pursue holiness. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, let our coach get you in shape for your position on God's team. That means you're going to have to spend some time reading the playbook, you see, the word of God. It means you're going to have to talk to the coach in prayer. You're going to have to be in communication with the coach. And it means you're going to have to practice with the team. What's the team? The church the body of believers. You cannot grow to become all that you want to be in Christ apart from this body or a body of believers. You know, you're going to meet 
someday an old man or an old woman down the road. Maybe it'll be 10 years from now. Maybe it'll be 20 years from now or 30 years from now. And that person will be there waiting for you. You will be catching up with them. What kind of old man or old woman will you meet? He may be seasoned. He may be soft. He may be gracious. A gentleman who has grown old peacefully and gracefully surrounded by a whole host of friends. Friends who call him blessed because of what his life has meant to them. Or he may be an old man that is bitter and disillusioned, dried up like an old buzzard without a good word for anyone, soured, friendless, and all by himself, all alone. You see, that old man will be you. He'll be the composite of everything you do, say, and think today and tomorrow. His mind will see things in a mold that you have made by your beliefs. His heart will be turning out what you've been putting into it. Every little thought, every deed goes into this old man. Every day in every way, you're becoming more and more like yourself. Amazing but true. You're beginning to look more like yourself, think more like yourself, and talk more like yourself. You're becoming yourself more and more. And if you live in terms of only what you're getting out of life, that old man, he gets a little smaller. He gets a little drier. He gets a little harder, crabbier, more self-centered. But open your life to serving Jesus Christ. Open your life to growing in his grace. And you began to take on more of his life, don't you? More of his character, more of his actions. And you begin to think in terms of what you can give, what contribution you can make for the Savior in life, how you can serve, how you can grow in your faith. And that old man down the road, oh, he gets better. He becomes softer, kinder, and greater because he has learned to take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ in practice. See, pursue holiness, honor God in how we treat others, because it is impossible to live at peace when we choose the unholy path in our lives. Verse 15 in Hebrews, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this, many become defiled. Falling short of the grace of God is not about a rejection of the gospel. To say that it is here, I think, misses the entire point. Here's what he's saying in Hebrews. Don't trade your right to discover and enjoy all that God has promised you for the cheap thrills of this world. Just like the firstborn in the ancient world, you have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. God has made promises to us about our future as believers. Promises given purely out of his grace. You don't deserve them. I don't deserve them. None of us do. But God has promised a future to his people because why? Of his love for you. And that's why verse 15 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. In other words, don't fail to trust God to keep his word in your life. Don't fail to trust him with his word. Don't fail to look at God's grace in our time of help because it is grace that helps us to endure all of us. All of us, every person in this room will come short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect, but none of us need to come short of the grace of God. Do you hear the difference? You see, God's grace stands ready to help us press on in our faith, to walk down that road to maturity. God promises his grace to help us meet every single circumstance in life, every single one. But there's a danger that a believer might become so preoccupied with their circumstances in life, their situation in life, that they fail to take refuge in God's amazing grace. His grace that is meant to enable us to hold strong through any adversity that we could face. And so he says here in the text, he says, look out for one another. Look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. God's grace cannot fail. It never can. God's grace cannot fail. But we can fail to take advantage of it. Oh, yes, we can. Help the brother or sister in Christ stumbling in their faith. See to it. Make every effort. No one needs to miss out on enjoying God's promises. And yet so many believers do just that. They walk around in a spiritual poverty most of their lives, not knowing how rich they are in Jesus Christ. There are promises in the word of God that cover every single area of life, that take care of every single need, and they are your birthright as a child of God. But see what happens. 
some believers ignore the promises of God, or they don't even take the time to discover what these promises are. They don't take the time to look in the word of God and study it for themselves because they'd rather chase after the things out there in the world here and now that have far less value. One of the many things that God has given us is the power over sin. He has given us the ability to keep the bitter root of sin from taking hold in our lives. And that's why verse 15 tells us, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. You don't have to let sin spring up in your life like a bitter root. Because when you sin, all you need to do is confess that sin to God. Amen. And your relationship with Jesus Christ is restored. Admit it and then turn away with it. Because if it takes root in your life and destroys not only just you, but it's going to affect everybody around you, in your family, in the church. Follow what is happening here in the text. The author is actually pulling this from the Old Testament. He's pulling this concept of the bitter root from Deuteronomy 29. Let's look at those two verses. Deuteronomy 29, verses 18 and 19, it says, So that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Watch this next part. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart. See, the point of this is that Hebrews is not just talking about bitterness. Pulling this from Deuteronomy, it's talking about God's people trying to live however they want, trying to live with a lack of faith in Christ, trying to live with a lack of faith in God's word. Moses warned of the day when the Hebrew people would turn away from God and warned that the root would be planted that would produce this bitter poison. The warning is, if a person of faith turns away from God and then still assumes to have the blessing of God upon their life as they continue in sin, as they continue to drift away from God, this plants an evil seed that begins to spring up and grow out of control. And eventually, the only thing that will come will be a crop of sorrow and pain. And so the idea back in verse 15 of Hebrews is that if this should happen, this root of bitterness caused by a lack of faith, it will spring up. It will cause trouble. It will cause all sorts of problems. And by this, what does it say? Many become defiled. And so the message is this. When hard times come, the temptation is going to be there. I can guarantee you this. The temptation will be to drift further and further away from God. Be on guard against it in your own life. Be on guard against it in the lives of those in your church family. Because if this bitter root ever finds fertile soil, its bitter fruit will develop. The stubborn, defiant sin of just one single person. The prideful rejection of God's way, of God's enabling grace in life, can take down a whole group of believers. It can spread through a church. It can spread through a family. Because why? Sin is contagious. Be on guard for the person thumbing their noses at the grace of God. Believers attempting to do their part away from God. Not walking with the Lord. Because it brings destruction to the entire church. Their poison is like a weed that just spreads in the church. And it just gets everybody impacted. The picture given is of a plant that takes root in the soil of this world, feeding on poison ground, producing contaminated fruit. This is the danger of the bitter root. It is the most dangerous and most contagious sin in a church. It leads to gossip. It leads to fighting. It leads to lies. This bitter root has destroyed many churches. An elderly couple were living together in a nursing home. Now, they had been married for 60 years, but it wasn't a good 60 years. Their relationship was filled with constant arguments, disagreements, marriage moments, shouting at one another. These fights didn't even stop when they got in the nursing home. You'd think it would, but it didn't. This couple argued and squabbled from the time they got up in the morning until the time they fell in bed at night. It became so bad that the nursing home threatened to throw them out of the nursing home if things didn't change. 
Even then, the couple couldn't even agree on, well, what do you do? And finally, the wife said to her husband, I'll tell you what, Joe, let's pray that one of us dies. And after the funeral is over, I'll go live with my sister. (laughs) Well, sometimes that's the way we treat one another in the church. That's sad but true, isn't it? That is the way we treat one another in the church. You see, the call is not to just simply endure one another, waiting for the people not walking with God to move on or die. Come alongside your brother and sister in Christ. Help them to rely on the grace of God. Help them to endure the trials and live in the peace of Christ. By what? Faith. Verse 16, two more verses, and then we're going to take it home. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Can you imagine? For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. These are some somber words. The good news is that Jesus has already released you from the power of sin in your life through his death on the cross. As you depend on him, you don't need to let bitterness or anger, worry, or any other sin take root in your life and do so much damage. Specifically, verse 16 tells us that you don't have to let things like sexual immorality ruin your life. That's actually the idea in verse 16, where some of the translations use the word fornicator. It refers to sexual immorality. Now, this is interesting that it's included here. Why? Because we have no record in the Old Testament of Esau being immoral. We have no record of this at all. But some of the Jews did regard his marriages to Hittite women as immoral. And either way, the lesson given is that sexual immorality has no place amongst Christians. See, because God expects his people to follow the standards that he's written down for us in his word. And God forbids sexual sin. It doesn't matter what the world wants to show us on Netflix. It doesn't matter what the world wants to show us on TV. God forbids sexual sin because it has the power to destroy us both physically and spiritually. Do not underestimate the power of sexual sin. It's devastated many lives. It's destroyed families. It's destroyed churches and even nations. God is wanting to protect his people from hurting themselves. You know, when a young person chooses to give in to sin, a sexual sin like that, like a virginity issue, they've lost their purity. There's nothing that can ever bring it back, right? Because there's a consequence there. The choice was made and the choice stands. God does not turn back the clock and undo consequences. And that's actually a running theme all throughout the book of Hebrews. God does not turn back the clock and undo the consequences of our sin, but he has given us the power, the ability to turn from sin. No believer in Jesus Christ needs to be a victim of sin, but that is exactly what so many people do. They trade the grace and the power of God for the passing pleasures of sin that has never worked the pain it brings in the end. You know, if you think about Esau, this guy was an interesting man. He sold his birthright, and you can find the story in Genesis 25. He traded something of such great value for what? A bowl of stew. It must have been one bowl of stew. I mean, it must have been amazing. Because as the firstborn son in the family, when he sold his birthright, he surrendered not his position of being born first. He gave up his rights as a firstborn son. He gave up the privilege of serving as a priest to his family. The firstborn son was consecrated or given over to God. In a Hebrew family, the firstborn son was given to God to serve him. He would have had the privilege of representing his his family before God as the priest of the family. Now, later on in time, of course, that privilege would be transferred to the tribe of Levi in Israel. But when Esau lived the priesthood, it still belonged to the firstborn son. By selling his birthright, he gave up the priesthood. He also gave up a double portion of his father's estate. When the father's estate was divided up among the sons, the firstborn son typically got twice as much as the rest of his brothers. And for the family of Abraham, Isaac, this included the promised land. 
But it was still, at this point, just a promise. It was just a promise. The only land his family owned was just a graveyard. All that he had was a promise from God, a promise that the family would inherit much more land one day. But you see, for a man like Esau, that promise, it didn't mean much. It didn't mean a lot. He didn't care about the covenant promises of God. So when Esau sold his birthright, he gave up the priesthood. He gave up on the promises of God and he gave up his power. He gave up his authority as the head of his entire family. Now, if something happened to the family, the firstborn son had authority over the younger brothers. But with that authority also came a huge responsibility, the responsibility to provide for his mother until her death and any unmarried sisters until they got married. That's why they got the double portion of the estate so they could provide for the family. Esau, hear me, had it all. As the firstborn son, he had the power. He had the promise of God. He had the priesthood and he traded it all away for a bowl of stew. Now, the promise of God, it didn't mean anything to him. The authority and responsibility of caring for his family didn't mean anything to him. He was hungry. He needed something to feed his face. He wanted a full belly. So he gave up something that had eternal value for a bowl of stew. Esau sold his birthright. And I warn you, Christian, don't do the same. Don't repeat the same sin. Don't sell your birthright like Esau did. Don't trade away your privileges that you have in Jesus Christ for the momentary pleasures of this fallen and unredeemed world. Don't exchange something of infinite and eternal value for cheap thrills here and now. Because every believer in Christ has a birthright. Every believer in Christ has special privileges because they're considered firstborn sons of God. This is what we're going to see when we get to verse 23, because verse 23, it actually says that believers belong, what, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. You see, like Esau, Believers in Christ are considered to be God's firstborn. And that means as our inheritance, we have certain rights. It means believers have the right of priesthood. You are a priest as a believer in Christ. They have the right of the promises of God and they have the right and power and authority of God. God's power rests in his people. His authority rests in us. But the Bible warns us as Christians here in verse 16, see to it that no one is unholy like Esau. Don't sell out. Let's say it like that. Don't sell out. Don't reject your priesthood. Don't reject your moment by moment opportunity to have direct access to God, to go chase after something stupid in this world. Just like the firstborn sons of long ago, you have been set apart as holy to be separate, to be used by God. Don't give up on the promise of God. Don't give up on the promise of God and the power of God over sin in your life. You see, Esau rejected God's plan, and once he sinned, he couldn't undo it, could he? Once he sinned, he could not undo his actions. The Hebrew people, they had done the same thing in the past, you remember. They had rejected God's offer of the promised land, and that generation could not undo their actions, teaching us that sin can be forgiven. The relationship with God can be restored, but many times your actions and the consequences that come, they cannot be undone. To reject God's grace for a living, to reject his enabling grace to walk with him will reap terrible consequences in your life. Esau, he found no place for repentance. The changing of the mind is all it means here. Esau changed his mind. He wanted his inheritance back, but what was done was already done. See, I don't think at this point, I've been thinking about this all week. I don't think Isaac knew that Esau had sold his birthright. Isaac wanted to bless Esau. But when Jacob stole the blessing, it confirmed something. It confirmed what had already been done when Esau had given it up. Esau, he cried to Isaac and wanted him to change his mind, but it was impossible. It was impossible. And Esau, he pleaded with Isaac, but only tears and rejection await those who sell out the inheritance that God promises his children. Meaning your sin, it absolutely can be forgiven, but the consequences may never be undone and your reward in heaven can be lost. 
No amount of pleading. There is a somber warning here, and I hope you hear it. No amount of pleading with God, even tears, can change this. Because your fate rests in the hands of a sovereign God who has warned you that sin never pays. No believer can forfeit their position as firstborn in the family of God, but you can absolutely forfeit your inheritance that God has given you as firstborn. Rick Garman, he wrote about what happened to his daughter Katie in the fall of 2002. She became a victim of date rape. She was 18 years old at the time, and she was just a freshman in college. Too humiliated to speak about what happened, even with her own family, she switched schools and attempted to move on with her life. But the scars of this traumatic event began to fester in her life. And over the next 14 months, she withdrew from her friends. She withdrew from her family. She developed an eating disorder and began losing weight. Finally, confronted by her mother, Julie, Katie explained to the family what had happened to her. Through prayer, through support of the family, and through her faith in the grace of God, Katie was able to overcome the pain and return to a normal life. But Katie was not the only one struggling. Her father, Rick, was fighting his own battle against the desire for revenge at any cost. You see, when he heard the news of what had happened to his daughter, Rick developed a plan, a plan that he was going to carry out, a plan to kill the man who had so deeply wounded his daughter. Listen to his painful words. I pulled back from Julie and everybody else. Get up, go to work, think about the plan, and try to forget. Go home, try to go to sleep, dream the plan. I plotted to drive through the campus and use my Smith & Wesson bolt-action rifle. I'd sit in the parking lot as long as necessary until he walked by. Then I could get it out of my head and Katie could start eating again. Katie came home for the weekend two months after the truth came out. It tore me up to see her. She didn't talk to me as much anymore. I missed watching the Atlanta Braves with her. I missed laughing with her. I just plain missed her. Julie tried to tempt her with a great meal on Saturday. Sitting across from Katie, I kept my eyes on my food. It felt as though we lived in a funeral home. The only sounds were those clanking of silverware and the clinking of ice, but I couldn't take the phoniness. I couldn't take how fake it was. So I slammed my chair to the table and took off to my room in the basement. I like this guy's room. He said, I spent a lot of time down there in my getaway room of guns and the sports channel. Methodically, I started cleaning the rifle that I would use. Then I heard my son, Thomas, trotting downstairs, and he said this, What you doing, Dad? I kept on cleaning my gun, and I never looked at him. I rocked in my recliner with the gun across my lap. Can I help you clean, Dad? I didn't say a word. You going hunting? I just looked up at him. His eyes, so brown, they looked almost black, just like mine. He stood inches from my knees, his hair cut to match a G.I. Joe flat top, just like mine. I just kept a fixed gaze upon my son and moved that red rag around in circles as I cleaned. Our eyes met. Thomas's eyes brimmed with tears. He knows. Dear God, I think my son knows my plan. I stopped polishing the gun and laid it on the floor by the chair. Come here, boy, give your daddy a hug. He wrapped his arms around me as tight as a cobra. Thomas's love was somehow stronger than the hatred that I had. His hug began to crumble my rage like a sledgehammer breaking a wall, chip by chip. Sweet Jesus, what have I been thinking? My job's not finished. Forgive me, Thomas isn't raised. If I go to jail, he won't have a father. God help me. Locking the gun in the cabinet, I made a choice. I made a choice to forgive. God, I got to let go of this hate. It's killing me. The decision started in my head, not from any feeling. Swallowing back tears, Thomas and I walked upstairs together, my arm on his shoulder. And these are his final words. He says, I came so close. The message is, with every single sin that we commit, with every sin we commit, we have a choice. There are sins that will rob us of God's enabling grace. All you have to do is forsake your rights as a believer. All you have to do is hold on to bitterness towards others. Or all you have to do is just live for the world. It doesn't take much to live for the world. 
Many would have considered Esau to be a good man. I mean, he was a good hunter, if nothing else, a man who loved his father. But he stands in Scripture as a warning to each of us that God's grace does not fail, but we can fail to depend on God's grace. And the cost of giving in to sin means the loss of something so much greater. We are children of God and firstborn sons. Because of this, we possess rights that have been given to us by the grace of God. But if we choose to fall short of the grace of God, if we choose to turn away from God, even after he has empowered us to live for him, we cannot forfeit eternal life as the redeemed in Christ, but we can forfeit some of the inheritance that could be ours in the kingdom of God. And so let me ask you this question. Is your sin worth it? Is your sin worth it? See, the grace of God has given every one of us an opportunity to serve God in this life, in this time, right here, right now. And what you do with it, believer, it's up to you. You can choose to live in sin or you can choose to live for the kingdom of God. His grace is there. His grace is sufficient. Will you live in it? Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879-259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.